very interesting last night. Can't tell you any more about that right now, but I'd like to move on with Max Dashu. Max is back this morning, and Max has some really interesting things to say to you today about, let's see, this is, what are we gonna hear about today? Magna Mater and Isis of 10,000 Names. Isis of 10,000 Names, how very interesting. Well, what have you got here in your hands? Okay, well, I have actually got. here a painting of Isis that I did for the Daughters of the Moon tarot deck long ago. And the idea of the high priestess card really is modeled on oh. the Egyptian columns. You've got the papyrus and the lotus. Oh, wonderful. You know, and there's various other symbols all here having to do with it. Just really restoring Osset, Isis, back to oh, her comedic form. You know, because there's a lot of uh, European projections that have happened over the years. But this going back to the original Northeast African form of her. And so in this presentation, I'm not really, oh, I'll, I'll say that in a minute. I just want to mention also my book is coming out next month, oh. which is in Pagans. Women Ooh. in European Folk Religion. Witches and Pagans, Women in European Folk Religions. Oh, looking forward to that. And this is that. actually volume seven of a series. It's a 15 volume series called Secret History of the Witches. But this will be the first volume published. Okay? And the last thing I first have to volume, show you here. First volume, Secrets of Witches, don't forget it. Is uh, I do a more international work, and this is called Goddess Treasures, which is one of the many prints that I have of heritages. And so these are goddesses, in this case, in gold and jade and turquoise. And oh, how beautiful. Things. Okay, but um, what I want to say introductorily is that what we're looking at in this presentation is not Isis in her, primarily in her comedic um, form. I see. It's the fact that she became maybe the first great international religion, the spread of Isis veneration all over the Roman Empire. Oh. You know, and then not only Isis, but other goddess, because there was, under the Roman Empire, there was this great syncretism that happened of Anatolian and Celtic and Balkan and North African traditions and sharing of symbols and stories. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. Wonderful. Let's have a big magic all welcome to Max Dash. Magna Mater. One moment, moment back. And here we're seeing an image on the left of Isis, Osset in the original Kemetic, and on the right of Kibele, or as it says there on the Roman coin, Mater Deum, Mother of the Gods. So these are two of the deities. You, you see the word Magna Mater, or the great goddess, being applied to them. And in this period, we're talking about the first, second, third centuries of the common era, these goddesses were all beginning to blend in various ways of their attributes. But I want to first just ground us because Osset, whose name means the throne, and you see the hieroglyph of the throne on her head, is a really great goddess of Kemetic civilization going back thousands of years. She's in the pyramid texts. The image of her suckling her son, Heru, Horus, is something that the Madonna has been modeled on in the Christian era. But what people don't realize is that these statues, bronzes and many various different forms of this icon were in the tens of thousands. That's why they're in museums all over the world. They're just, they were mass produced. People had them in their homes because she was the great goddess of Egypt, especially the later you get in time, the more importance she assumes in Egyptian history. So you can see the, the Cairo Museum is full of these images. And you see this worship spreading out into Western Asia so that Canaanite and Hebrew iconography is very strongly influenced by Egyptian themes. And so this scarab is from North Africa. The Phoenicians spread Isis iconography all over the Mediterranean. And just to remember another aspect of Osset is that she has the sistrum. She is the great enchantress strong of tongue and mighty of words. And so you have her in her aspect as a priestess, as a medicine woman, really. And you see a syncretism beginning to happen with Isis herself in the Ptolemaic period. So we're talking, you know, the, the early centuries BCE and following. And so that you see these clay mold made figurines of Isis and you can see she's being Hellenized here even to the point, not just in the way the draperies are modeled, but also the crown has shrunk. The, the cow horns with the solar disk have shrunk down, and they are now flanked by ears of wheat, which is an attribute of Isis as the bread giver. 
but you see some Greek women's mysteries stuff coming in here, a lot of syncretism with Demeter, which is itself a backwash because it's initially Isis and the Egyptian goddesses who influenced the stories of Demeter and Greek civilization, and then you see it coming back in these new forms to Egypt many millennium later. So here she is seated on a basket, and this is the grain basket. So again, uh, the, the farming and uh, cereal aspects of Demeter and Ceres in the Latin world, still suckling the child. And you can see how pervasive this is, because in the first century, the second century, the Magna Mater was the great predominant religion of the common people. And you really a very, not just a competitor Christianity, it was really more popular than Christianity in this period. And we see also the veneration of Isis going into the south, up the Nile, into deep Africa. So you have Sudanese iconography, which has its own traits, particularly the large breasts. You don't see that in comedic art. And you see her also being adopted into late Palestinian art. This is from the West Bank, the Madonna iconography, and we're going to look at that at the very end here. So you do have the suckling mother in the Italian world. This is actually Sicilian, and actually two children here. Head has been struck off, but they, they're projecting the name of this goddess as Ibla, and she's a black goddess of Sicily. And that is a place where you see not only Isis, but also Kibele. And this is an Anatolian goddess, Phrygian goddess, out of what's now Turkey. And so her image, combined often with Hecate, is carved into the li living rock at a place called Akrai. And the site is called in Sicilian, Isantoni, which means the great holy ones. So you see that the sacredness was retained in folk tradition. Now here's Cabelli in her earliest form, and she's carved into the rock once again, so you see a continuity there. And, and the Phrygians called her Matar Kubileia, and so this all gets Hellenized also. But, and Greeks invented all kinds of insulting stories about her, but she was the great mountain mother. She was the great mother, and her ceremonies were ecstatic, mountaintop, wilderness, night-long, trance dances with drums and cymbals. So she's shown often with those instruments in her hands, and this is still an Anatolian mural, but you're seeing again the Hellenizing, and she has her, her lion, one of her symbols, in her lap. Usually she's sitting in a throne flanked by lions, and she's holding up again the frame drum. So this worship also, like that of Isis, <laughs> spread first in the eastern Mediterranean into the Greek port cities, and then from there it winds up going all the way as far as Spain and all the way up into uh, Germany and various other outposts of the Roman Empire. And of course also you have her on the Roman coins. The Romans adopt her because they, saying that they were descendants of Aeneas who came out of Asia Minor, you know, the old Etruscan lineage li linkage to Lydia, uh, they actually, when the Punic invasion coming out with Hannibal out of North Africa was threatening Rome, they were freaking out and they said, what can we do? And they asked the Sibylline books, how can, how can we be helped? And the Sibylline books said, bring the Edian mother from her Phrygian homeland. And so they did. The Romans came and they stole the black stone that was the incarnation of this goddess, brought her back and installed her on a temple on the Capitoline Hill. But you, get, you begin to see the mysteries of Cabelli from that moment on, and this is like around 200 BCE, uh, being adopted into Rome. And so you have the chariot drawn by lions, the goddess wearing, we're going to see this crown, this mural crown appears with other goddesses of Syria and Asia Minor, but always with the drum, because ecstatic trance uh, is very much at the core of her mysteries. And you see some very Roman-looking statues of her with the lion throne, the mural crown, and a lot of different sculptures. So this also became adopted, especially by the common people. Uh, all of these goddesses uh, came into the Roman culture, which is not the classical Roman pantheon by this time that we usually learn about, but is really uh, syncretic, and it was, it's importing Isis and Cabelli and these other goddesses. 
And here you can see blood stains on her statues because they were pouring bull's blood over her from the Torobilium sacrifice. Wealthy person could have a bull sacrificed and there was a special platform where that happened and they would be underneath and the blood would pour through the planks and they would literally have a bloodbath over them to receive a benediction of this life force. Not for the vegans, definitely. But <laughs> So here's another one that is from Asia Minor and you can see a little Greek influence. Nike is holding up the garland of victory next to the goddess and you have a serpent floating through the air over the other woman who is pouring onto an offering. We're going to see a few more of these patera offering bowls pouring onto altars in other slides. But that serpent floating through the heavens is a motif out of Cretan civilization. I'm going fast because I want to put all of this in here, and there's lots more that could be said all about this. So in Syria, and to some extent also in Jordan, uh, rather than calling her Kibele, she's either called Tuche, which means luck in Greece, Greek, or she's called Atargatis. And we're going to see a lot of her a little further on in the uh, presentation. Here again with the mural crown and lion throne. And here she is very much Hellenized, but from Asia Minor, holding up her drum. And you can see all the way over into Portugal. And there were temples to Kibele and, and to D Diana and to uh, various other goddesses, particularly Isis in Spain, Hispania. All right, and here's one, uh, Stella from Dusseldorf. So you can see the legions are bringing these venerations. There were temples to Kibele up there in the Rhineland. And you also have this Greek inscri inscription, Matron, to the mother, to the great mother, which they think refers again to Kibele here in the Greek, early Greek colonization before the Romans in southern France. This spread really far also into Central Asia. And Afghanistan is a really great example of a syncretic uh, culture because you have Kibele in her chariot drawn by lions. Then you see Helios, the sun, Ishtar as the planet Venus with the multi pointed star symbolism. And then over on the side, you see one of the Magi, the, the Indo-Iranian fire altar priests there on the right. And so there's this whole mixture of cultures, but that's how far she reached from the Atlantic Portugal all the way into Central Asia to the borders of Pakistan. So this is how all this is spreading and really taking hold. People are responding to this. Now, in what's now Bulgaria and Macedonia, Cotis, the Thracians were cousins of the Phrygians, and so they had a very close form of a goddess who also wears the tall polos headdress that you see a lot in Asia Minor. And you see her also with the drum and cymbals there. Uh, Cotis also is a trance dance goddess of the wilderness. But I want to now go back to Anatolia and, and follow a different <coughs> strand. You will see this goddess usually referred to as Artemis Ephesia, the many-breasted Artemis, or Polymastis, as they were, she was called in Latin in Roman times. But her older name is re related to us in Greek as Upis. And scholars think that's a, a feminine Greek ending, the I-S, same as in Isis. Hepatu, or Hebat, this may actually be a Hellenization of a name of an older Horian goddess out of Syria. And so that's one theory. But in any case, she is a great mother. There's their polis headdress again, all engraved with animals and birds. She's got animals engraved all over her body. They're throwing up their hooves in veneration toward her. Um, now the multi-breasts, this has been controversial. We had a guy in the 90s saying, those aren't breasts, those are the testicles of sacrifice bulls. And all the postmodernists went, yeah, those aren't breasts, those are the testicles of sacrifice bulls. Well, it's more complicated than that because actually this is what we could call a multivalent symbol. They look like breasts. The, in Roman times they were clearly understood as breasts. But actually, when they did an excavation in the 1980s of the older layers of this temple before the great seventh wonder of the world uh, that was built in the 6th century, they found that there had been a garland of amber ornaments in this shape. Particularly look at those ones on the right there, that same tapering 
that we saw before, and that she was wearing a garland of pomegranates, which is one of the great goddess symbols that we know from various traditions in the Mediterranean. And so what had happened was there was no stone statue. There was only a wooden plank xoanon. This is the older Greek temples. Hera and all the rest of them originally did not have marble statues. They had a wooden plank, and they garlanded it. So that's where the real symbolism comes from. And if you look at these coins that are showing what the statue looked like, in you know it's like a 40 meter tall, uh, huge, huge temple, the largest temple in the ancient world, maybe except for the one of Baal in uh, Baalbek. But uh, you can see also the outstretched hands, and you see poppies cascading down from her hands. And so also poppy garlands seem to be part of the picture. And you can see the garlands also spread over her chest there. She is not the only pillar goddess with the outstretched hands and these same attributes, the garlands and the polos headdress. We also see an unnamed goddess of Caria. So this is, again, Western Turkey, different part, not Lydia. And Hera Samion. This is the island of Samos off the southwestern coast of Turkey, and she looks exactly like what we know as Artemis Ephesia. We can see Hera in both forms on these coins, so at the left in her archaic form, her Asiatic form, and on the right on that same left coin as a classical Greek goddess, and these are all labeled Samion. Here you can see a very clear image of her with the garlands of poppies. And like the pomegranates, the redness of the fruit and the flower is very much about the lifeblood, life force, and uh, benediction. If we go into Aphrodisias, this is a city in southwestern Turkey, inland, the goddess Aphrodite was worshipped, so they did pick up that great Greek name, but this doesn't look anything like an Aphrodite that most of us would recognize because she's, again, Asiatic with the poppy garlands this time coming off her headdress, and also her body is beginning to look like that of a bee. And that bee iconography is known also with Upis Artemis Ephesia. But Atergatis is a, once again a form of the planet Venus in the Syrian world. And you can see again the wheat ears popping up on either side, like we saw on the crown of Isis. But she's very much as a pillar and that's a very strong theme throughout Syria and what's now Turkey. And here we find two forms of the goddess uh, from the cities of Sardis and Ephesus, and Sardis is there on the left. But sometimes she's aniconographic, and so she's really aniconic. So the betel, or the stone incarnation of the goddess, is shown here, and they've, she's garlanded with various attributes including something that looks very much like the crown of Hathor, but you know she's just in the form of a stone. This one is also from that world of Sardis, and it's very interesting to me because the front of her looks very much like some of the Neolithic, uh, megalithic statues in Europe, thousands of years before this was carved, with the necklaces and the belt and the cloak thrown over her, the back of her body. But this is, of course, only about the 6th century at the earliest. And so there's no real uh, historical relationship here. It's just sort of a thematic, interesting connection. You can see the garlands there again very clearly. So then you have uh, Artemis is brought by Greek colonists into Marseille, what they call Massilia, where the name comes from. And so she is shown there. Often you see the stag as a connection with her, which we see as well with Diana. And so this iconography is also coming over into the Western Mediterranean, which we both see at Marseille. We see it also in West, Eastern Spain, and we see it particularly on the Aventine Hill of Rome, where Diana in her earliest forms takes place. And Diana, the statues, they say, the oldest Latin sources tell us Diana there was modeled after Artemis Ephesia. It's very interesting to see some of the sculptures. This is the one that I think is the supreme sculpture of her. It's the finest. And she has African features. And there's a move that begins. I can't really date this statue. I'm thinking it's sometime after the 6th century, maybe quite a few centuries after that. But um, the profile is an African profile. And so you see black Diana 
beginning to come up because in Latin they're calling her Diana instead of Artemis. And so there are these two famous statues of black Diana. And uh, I have another view of them. Uh, we're also seeing Kibele being blackened. So in addition to the modeling of the Madonna on Isis nurturing Horus at her breast, we also have another sub-theme that is leading us toward the black Madonnas in the form of Ice, uh, sorry, as of Diana, black Diana, and also, as we'll see, of Kibele. Here's a close-up of her face. I think this is the one in the uh, <coughs> Napoli Museum in Italy. Oh, I have quite a few views of them. Really beautiful statues. And again, you know, polyvalent symbolism, because, you know, the breasts, I mean, they can be figs, they can be eggs. There's a lot of comparisons they have made, but the whole idea is that she is just brimming with life essence, you know, it's just pouring off of her. And this is also her lunar aspect because the moonshine is full of that yin essence. And then here in the Roman world, not so much in back in the east, but in the Roman world, you also see black cabelli. That's a hard C, by the way, in Latin. And so again, as a pillar goddess, mural crown, here she is again, back to Diana, but that same aspect that we just saw. So can you see that there's this, this mixing and matching and this sharing of symbolism and attributes and this bleeding between the boundaries of what were originally distinct ethnic goddesses in this sort of globalized world of the, the Roman Empire? And so Aphrodite of Aphrodisias in that same form as the pillar goddess with the veil and the polos headdress. And then later on, some of the villas, you have Diana Ephesia made into a fountain so that the breasts are actually spurting water. Very much in parallel with what you see in Indonesia, just by the by. So, okay, now I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to come back to Italy and to an indigenous goddess who is primarily known as Bona Dea, which means the good goddess. This name is used because her real name, Fauna, Fenta Fauna or Fenta Fatua, is taboo. It's not to be pronounced. It's kind of like with Yahweh. You know, you're not supposed to say those words because then you're calling in the deity. So you use a taboo name instead. This is from the murals at Pompeii in the Villa of Mysteries. And I think, I mean, they identify this as a female satyr, which I didn't know there were any such of a thing. But I think it is a form of bona dea, especially because she's suckling the goat. And this goat connection with these, this particular group of Roman goddesses is very strong. This is her primary aspect, however, is she's enthroned. Around her right arm is wrapped a serpent. Around her left arm, she has the patera, the offering uh, saucer for libation, or she has a cornucopia. So she shares attributes with Terra Mater, the Earth Mother, and with Ceres, the goddess of grain. Here she is with the patera and the cornucopia. And so this goddess was worshipped like Diana on the Aventine Hill. And this was a plebeian neighborhood in Rome, which meant that it was full of Syrians and Egyptians and people from southern Italy and the Greek world. And there were people from the Celtic world. And all it was a big melting pot of cultural mixing that was going on there. And so the cornucopia of Fortuna begins to be borrowed out. And we're going to see this all over the world, all over Europe and North Africa. Uh, Fortuna here is shown with the rudder, who, which is an attribute of Isis. She guides the ship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're going to borrow from each other in different ways. Here she is again, both with the rudder and with the wheel of fortune, which is named after her, Fortuna. Here she is in the Carthaginian world, after the Romans conquer and raise Carthage, then you have a much more Romanized form of culture coming up, and they begin really borrowing heavily from the symbolism of the Latin world. But that goes all the way up to the borders of Scotland. In northern England, you have various forms of Fortuna with the cornucopia, and she has the patera pouring libation onto the altar, and she's wearing the mural crown of Cabele. So you're mixing a native British goddess with Latin goddesses and also with West Asian goddesses. Here's another one, uh, very clearly of Fortuna. Who knows what they called her in Brit Britannic? 
And uh, so this is all going on. And some really beautiful small altars, which are beginning to be accessible now to us thanks to the internet. You can get color pictures of this stuff now. And this one's very interesting because like uh, Bonadea, she has the serpent who is drinking from her patera in one hand, and the other hand might be holding a beehive, which is an attribute of the Celtic goddess Nehalenia. So all this mix and match is going on. This is from the uh, Altar of Peace, and this is kind of a classic Earth Mother figure from the Roman world. In the south, it's much more Hellenized. They called it Magna Graecia, Greater Greece. And so Greek was spoken there, and the Greek goddesses, and they come up with this beautiful iconography of Demeter and of Persephone, or as they called her in Sicily here, Proserpina, with the dolphins. Isn't that beautiful? And then we have a few images of priestesses. Now in Rome, the state religion was run by males, and there were even most temples barred women from the ceremonies. And they would say, away with the woman, the slave. You know, there's, they're beginning the ceremonies. They would kick out the females. They would kick out those in servitude. But you did have women running their own ceremonies. And that was nowhere more strong than in the mysteries of Ceres. And this is a lot of the southern Italians coming up into Rome, brought along these ecstatic nighttime torch-bearing processions. They would go down to the Tiber. And the torches were treated with a particular chemical so that when they plunged their torch into the river and they pulled it up again, it would burst back into flame. And so really dramatic things going on there. And then you have the Bacchanals. And a lot of people don't know about this, but in 186 BCE in Rome, there was a huge persecution of the Bacchanals. And by that name, they were referring to the Greek mysteries, to all of the various goddess mysteries that were all getting rolled in together. And they closed off the exits to Rome, and they captured everybody who was trying to escape, and basically the, the Livy reports that 7,000 people were slain. And women were sent back to their husbands to be punished by their husbands, or at least patrician women were. So we don't really know exactly how many people died, but this is what I would consider the great first mass witch hunt that we know of historically. And yet these ceremonies went on and the state of Rome, the Senate, made a pact with the priestesses and they actually allowed the priestesses to have a temple which they had not officially had at that time till then. And here you see uh, Ceres herself also as a black goddess. This is a modern painting, but it's kind of interesting to see how these themes travel along. And it's really illuminating to look at some of the murals, the wall paintings from Roman villas. Here you see a lone woman with a pot on her head and a libation vessel making offerings to who knows what goddess. It could be Terra Mater, it could be Fortuna in that little shrine there, which is semi-wild with trees growing through it. And you see a bunch of people partying and dancing over there on the other side. So you can see that ecstatic element going on in the plebeian world. And just a lot of very common domestic ceremonies that don't get much notice. And a lot of them actually, particularly the ceremonies of Bonadea, are not reported by Roman men because they were not allowed to be present at them. They were women's mysteries. And so there was a lot of writings by men like Kikoro saying, well, you know, these women are doing all kinds of obscene things. You know, he, they, the Roman men's imaginations went wild imagining what all went on inside these ceremonies in which women drank wine, which they were normally forbidden to do. Okay, so parkai is the form of the fates, or the moiras, the Greeks would call them, and a threefold goddesses. And you see them as spinners. You've got a, one with a cornucopia. And this is symbolism that spreads all over the place. I mean, it's really an old Indo-European theme. But the threefold fateful goddess or female ancestor is something we see both in the Germanic world and the Celtic world. And we know about this because it was really precipitated, like a chemical precipitation, by the Roman influence. They didn't really make statues, limestone stelae, in either of those northern European worlds before the Romans came in. And they borrowed this custom. And by doing so, 
the, the Roman influence caused us to have all these images, which we would not otherwise have, and sometimes identifications of them with names. You know, and so they say matres, or they say matronai, or sometimes they na say the name of a clan. And so you've got a threefold goddess who is both an ancestral mother, a giver of abundance, so they're often holding loaves or apples in their laps. They're shown with the cornucopia, so they're borrowing that Roman symbolism, or with the distaff, which is one of the emblems of the fates. And that shell background, that scallop, is also uh, borrowed from the Mediterranean world. And so there's a whole fusion going on here, and as the Celtic, as the Gauls are beginning to start to speak Latin, there's all these shifts going on. Here you see them with the lopes. This is in Britain, on the, near the borders of Wales. And so these matre stones are found all over. There's some in, even in Spain and Italy, but primarily France, Britain, Luxembourg, uh, Germany, Western Germany. And so some of the stones that are carved in this way in uh, Britain take on aspects of other goddesses, particularly we know about Rosmerta, whose name means the great provider. And a lot of scholars have had been trouble uh, identifying the fact that she's actually got a butter churn there, that she's actually making butter. So this also connects us to Bridget and the mysteries of the dairy. But you do see, it, particularly in Gaul, but here also in Britain, a pairing of the native goddesses with various Roman goddesses, especially Mercury and Apollo. And so um, that starts to be carved out. And here you've got a triad with uh, Fortuna added into the mix. And you can see the cornucopia uh, being borrowed in there. Here Rosmerta is holding it, which completely fits her actual meaning of her name, is great provider, which is also symbolized by the very large giving hand that she's outstretching in this picture. Now then there was a backwash into Rome because the Latins came to know this goddess and they identified her with their goddess Maya. And when you were talking yesterday, David, about the Floralia, uh, Maya and the Floralia, this is all kind of going together. And so this is going back to Beltane and May Day. And help, happy Beltane to all. So you get these horn goddesses, and this is very Gaulish. You don't see these in uh, Greece. Uh, Here's a ex really beautiful example. This is one of my favorites because it shows the archaic British style. You know, she's nothing really particularly Roman about this picture. Not the horns, certainly not the uh, fringed garment off shoulder that she's wearing there. The distaff is universal, uh, Indo-European theme. And then you've got these antler goddesses that show up in Gaul. And like Bonadea, like Fortuna, they have the cornucopia and the patera, but unlike them, they have antlers. And so you see that, that influence shifting around in this way. This is more what the oldest statues carved by the Gauls look like. And what they resemble stylistically is not Roman at all, but much more congruent with the styles in Iberia, what is now Spain. And so there's a lot of these goddesses, some of them, again, like the matrone with apples in their lap, in their apron. The little dog is something that's characteristic of Gaul and the Netherlands. The goddess Nehalenia often also has this little dog. And then there's this goddess, Sirona or Thirona. And this is an interesting one, the one on the left. First, very native style, nothing to do with Roman style. But if you read the inscription, it says, to the goddess Dirona, that's the first line, and then it says Maior Magia, which is the title of Isis, great of magic. So you see that connection coming through of Egyptian influence, the titles of Isis. Here again, Sirona paired with Apollo. And her sacred places were thermal springs, so healing centers with hot springs. And she's got the serpent iconography uh, connected with that healing. And Apollo, as a historic Greek appropriator of goddess sites, gets folded into there, too. And then there's many other goddesses. Epona has a very strong influence on the Roman world, and it spreads all over the place from her original Celtic homeland, uh, not just in France and Britain, but also all the way out to Austria, places that hadn't been Celtic for a very long time. 
and uh, even to Greece. And she, here again, combinations of attributes. She has the basket of grain. But the horses are really her, her signature uh, attribute. And so she's not just a horse goddess. She's a giver of life force. So fruit and loaves. She's often shown with birth symbolism because you have not just the mare, but the colt as well. And she's a goddess of death and a conductor of the dead to the other world. And so here we see her in, this is a Romanian form of her, and the, the little cults are eating out of her lap. Here is a Greek form, so you can see how far the legions spread her veneration. But then now we're in the Balkan area, I want to go back to the Dacians and the, and the Thracians, and Bendis is the goddess at the center, and she's shown fl flanked by horsemen, and this is something you see a lot in southeastern Europe. And they have a lot to do with the Kuros and the Kuretes figures that you see in that part of the world and off into the Aegean Islands. If we go in the other direction, we go into Spain, and this is indigenous Iberian art. And really, she has nothing, none of this has anything to do with the style of Greco-Roman art. You know, she's very native, winged goddess. And you have clay pieces like this also showing her as... Uh, holding two children, like we saw earlier from Sicily, and you've got mothers and daughters and musicians. There's a temple to a goddess named Dea Kailestis. This means the goddess of the heavens, and it's a title of Uno Kailestis, and it's also a translation of the Carthaginian titles for the queen of heaven. So there's a Semitic connection here that's very strong in Spain. And this temple at Torre Paredones was excavated, and they found this head, and it actually has her name, Dea Caelestis, is written across her forehead, so identifying her. This brings us to Tunisia, where the Phoenicians settle under Dido in the 900s. And Carthage originally was Karthadash, which means the new city, because this is like they moved out to North Africa. And this is really where you get the name Tanit. It doesn't show up at all, or maybe very not very much, in Lebanon itself. And you can see that the icon of the goddess Tani very much resembles in some of its forms the Ankh that you see. So there's Egyptian influences going on here too. The later, more classic form of Tani is a woman, abstract woman with a long skirt and her arms raised in invocation or benediction. You also have the Caduceus, which most people in classical education would say, well, that is the symbol of the healing goddess Glepius, which is good as far as it goes. But if you go back further in time, Ishtar, and even before her, Inanna, also had this serpent staff. So it begins with the Semitic goddesses in Mesopotamia. Not that Inanna is Semitic, but really, actually, more so Ishtar. And then again, you know, the art in, in Tunisia begins to get Hellenized, and you start to see a shift in style, uh, very strong here. But she's got uh, the basket headdress. That's the kalathos that was characteristic of Greek women's mysteries. Here she is as Juno. So Juno and Tani are syncretized under the Roman Empire. The peacock is one of the symbols of that goddess. And Juno Kailestis is also shown on coins, riding on a lion. And she's got the mural crown on the left image there. And so this is interesting because this is sort of a Uranian uh, celestial form of the goddess in a Latin mold. Here's actually um, a temple of Kailestes at Duga. There was a really huge temple. The largest temple in Tunisia in Roman times was a different temple of Uno Kailestes, which eventually they Christianized into a church but then they found out that people were still coming there to worship Tani, and so the Roman legions raised it to the ground. They couldn't get this rid of this. But what's, here's what's interesting, is that in North Africa, she's being called Tani or Unokailestis, but in Syria, the same iconography of her riding on lion back is used for Atargatis. So we're back here to the Syrian goddess, and there's quite a few icons of her in this form. But then we can go into more native forms, going into still the Syrian desert, but in Jordan. 
and you have a goddess. Atar goddess is called Dea Syria, which means goddess of Syria, and she's also a goddess of fishes, and so you have her crown here of fishes. And there were lakes with sacred fish that were used in divination in rituals, both along the Gaza Strip in Ashdod and also inland at the city of Heropolis, which means holy city, and that was the temple city of Artagratus. Some scholars think that this image is also one of Atargatis, and a tympanum that you're looking at here is over a, a portal going into the temple. You, if you can make it out, she actually has leafery instead of clothing. She's wearing leaves. And then we have even more indigenous forms, which going back again to the Beytils of the uh, Semitic world, uh, they think that this rock-cut shrine here at Petra represents Al-Uzza, which is uh, Arabic for the Mighty One and is a primary name for the goddess Venus in the time of Muhammad, and her consort Du al-Shara, who later becomes Hellenized as Dusares. He's the god of the vine. So Aftar, this is related to Ishtar and Astarte and all of those names for the planet Venus. And this one is supposed to be scri inscribed in Nabataean, and I haven't figured out, it either says Al-Uzza or it says Alat or one of the other Arabic goddess names. So these are hard to find. When you look at pictures of Petra, you, you could get an impression that none of this was really there. And about five years ago, I was able to find this photo, really obscure source, and there are three niches cut into the rock at Sad el Mereria. And so the niche on the right, which we can hardly see, is empty. The middle one has the goddess veiled, as many of the Gnostic goddesses are in you know, this period and coming later on. And then the third niche, and I don't have a better photo of her, is a goddess on a throne flanked by lions. And so they identify her as Atar goddess because in Syria that's the, form, that's the name that's given to that aspect rather than calling her Kibele. She, like Tuche and many other Syrian goddesses, is shown with the mural crown and she's a protector of cities. That's what's that saying. And we, we had earlier the fish, as an attribute of Atar goddess, and the other animal sacred to her is the dove. And so this ties us in with a lot of these Christian symbolism that happened later on of picturing the Holy Spirit as a dove. This tied in to goddess iconography for, that was still very current in the ancient world at that time. So here's Atar goddess with her concert, Baal Haddad. Notice that they've really emphasized her spatially. Uh, this is at Dura Europus, which is more famous for a synagogue there. And this is also somewhere there in the Syrian desert, again with Baal, and they're becoming more and more Hellenized here, stylistically at least, if not in their attribute. He has bulls and she has lions. Got to keep that light off. Um, Tuche. This statue was in two pieces in two different mu museums, and recently they figured out that they belonged together, and so they were reunited. So you have Victory carrying the zodiac with Tuche, the goddess of fortune, at the center. Looks like she might have a little cornucopia there with her as well. And the zodiac is really important in this period, the first, second centuries. You are beginning to see denunciations of astrology and demonizations of goddesses associated with astrology. And this goes on both in the Gnostic, but especially in the, the mainstream Christian world. But colossal heads of Tuche at Kumajen, this is in southwest Turkey. And here she is for, shown in her form as the guardian goddess of Antioch. And she's riding on a male figure who represents the Orontes River that runs through that city with the mural crown but you find her in Jordan. And you know, this is really confusing. When I began studying this, I would see a statue like this and it's like, well, it, it looks Greek, you know? And so it's not very interesting to me because I wanted to know who the Jordanian goddesses are. But she's there underneath that, those borrowed robes. And so you see a lot of mosaics in Jordan and interesting twists on Greek symbolism. The label there says Thalassa, so she's the sea goddess, and you've got the dolphins and the fish and everything. But, you know, she looks like an Arab woman. 
And so this fusion is going on. This same period you're seeing still clay mold made figures of goddesses inside shrines. These have been going on for at least 900 years, maybe even 1300 years by the time these were created and holding their hand to their breast. Old Neolithic gesture there. And so at Ashkelon, this would be south of Tel Aviv, you have a goddess who has the polos crown, but in front of it is the horns and solar disk of Isis. And so they're naming her, and also the, the knot over the chest is also connected with Isis in the Hellenistic world. So mixing the attributes of these three goddesses. Originally, the knot of Isis is around her womb. It's the girdle of Isis around her belly and the knot representing the cervix over her womb. But the Greeks, maybe out of prudery, I don't know what, move it up and make it a knot between her breasts. And so like a lot of the older, I mean a lot of the younger images of Osset appear in that form. So Tuche is all over the place. You know, you see these goddesses spreading and she's got the cornucopia going on here. But this is on the, on the Atlantic side of Iberia. And then finally coming back to Isis. Uh, Lactance means the milk giver. And there are many styles of statues of Isis carved in different parts of the empire. In this case, this would be Turkey, holding and nursing Horus. Here's another one from Cyprus. And Paphos is the temple city of Aphrodite. This is the core of the whole veneration of Aphrodite for the whole world. This is where she came from. And those goddess temple cities welcomed Isis. You see the same thing going on for Diana at Aricia outside Rome, the, the temple city of the, the goddess of the Nemai Lake. And so there was a welcoming that happened. They saw a connection between their goddesses. And so here uh, in Campania, which is southern Italy, you've got, again, nursing Horus, and then instead of flanked by lions, flanked by sphinxes, they're playing with it a little bit. Also, griffins. You can see a little wheel there, so a little bit of fortuna. And on the back, the serpents of Bonadea. So we have priestesses all over the Mediterranean world, and for Roman women, this was a way to revitalize older women's mysteries culture that had been pushed down through repression under, under the Roman patrician state. So we have some very beautiful images of women with garlands and sistrums as they would have been in procession through the streets of Rome. Oops. And uh, this is a mural at Herculaneum where you've got the mysteries of Isis. The priest there in the foreground is probably not a woman because in the Egyptian rites, the men were at that point presiding. And so you have a certain uh, gendered hierarchy going on there. But you can see that women, there's women all in the flanks of this, and you have a lot of women participating enthusiastically in the ecstatic aspects of these processional and ceremonial gatherings. So this is from Aricia, the, the Diana sanctuary that I was telling you about. And you can see very African styles of dance being carried out along with images of baboons and ibises and the god Apis all being worked into a relief in Europe. And there's a lot of these murals. This is the house of the priestess of Isis in Pompeii, making her look very much like Minerva there with the spear. And here's your full bore syncretism. Isis, and you've got those green uh, ears, again, it's kind of uh, screwing up the view of what would have originally been her Hathor crown and the double Atif crown. She's got the cornucopia of Fortuna, and then she has an aegis of Minerva, right, the, the gorgon's head that Athena wears on her breast. So we've got, you know, four different goddesses going on here. And not only in Rome itself, but all the way out into Iran, we find the same thing going on. That top figure, crown of Isis, cornucopia, as well as a Minerva. Even if we go over into Kashmir, you could argue for a cornucopia influence by way of Afghanistan going on here in this sculpture of Gajalakshmi, the Lakshmi with the elephants. And then 
what happens, there's a very strange contradiction here because in Rome, Isis is whitened and made to appear European at the same time that they were blackening Diana and Cabelli. So what's the explanation of that? It's really interesting. But you see the priestesses of Isis, sometimes it's hard to tell which is a priestess, which is supposed to be the goddess. And other goddesses are also being spread. This is a baobo of uh, Egyptian type, actually, from North Africa, turning up in southern France. Uh, some people call this figure Isis Baobo because of the sow connection with Isis. And if anybody knows what that, it looks like an abacus that she's holding. I've seen uh, numerous images with that symbol, and I can't figure out what it is. Here's another sow riding female from Pompeii. And here is Isis with Sphinx and Sistrum, her crown almost unrecognizable at this point, Roman style. And you have this orientalizing style where the Romans were making mosaics imitating Egyptian mural style. And there's Isis with an unusual staff. And here she, uh, Io, Isis, all these goddesses are also being mixed up together and even combined with Cleopatra and the asp those stories. And you have also uh, Isis priestesses in Rome using the baskets of the Demeter mysteries of Ceres and also the, the serpent handling ceremonies that we know of already going back, what, at this point, 2,000 years into ancient Crete. So there's this whole mishmash that's happened by this period of time. And you have deifications of the seasons and you have the gorgons and snake women of various types and medusas and what happens in this period is you also have a rise of gnosticism and so i can't say for sure that this is barbello that's my theory about her this was a clay figurine that's in the egyptian museum and very different in style from the slender egyptian figures of yester melania uh, but the Barbelo and other names are given to the great goddess in the Gnostic Sophia traditions, and they're basically talking about the mother of wisdom, the mother of the all, as Barbelo is referred to in various Egyptian Gnostic scriptures. We could also see a connection with the veiled goddess there at Sad el Meriya in Petra, and because we see that same iconography of the goddess with the veil, and that that one inscription to Isis where they say, no, it's not nice, it's, it's uh, knit, and none has ever lifted my veil. And so you have her veiled, and this represents mystery. This is actually, uh, again, Hera, Samion, but shown with the Gnostic symbolism. So lots of serpent symbolism, and there's a war going on between the Christians who are the serpent is bad, and the Gnostics are, no, the serpent is an overthrown deity who is good and who gives us knowledge, and the jealous creator god of Genesis doesn't want us to know about it. But you have, by the late fourth century, a massive Roman repression of all of these traditions. Only Christianity is a legal religion, and all the rest are persecuted, temples are being razed, looted, turned into stables. You can see how long the idea of Isis persists already still in the 500s. But what we see in the aftermath of that is destruction and literal effacement of Isis, of Hathor, of the goddesses. Here's Isis Lactans feeding the pharaoh and just a huge chunk taken out of the mural to you know, remove her face. Statues attacked, you know. And notice they left the male figure alone and took out the female. And you see, I went, when I was at Karnak, I noticed the special targeting. It's not that there are no defaced male gods, because there are, but they really especially went after the goddesses. Okay, and this happened also at Petra. So somebody climbed up there for the sole purpose of smashing out the face and sometimes they would also take stone blocks carved with goddesses and they would use them as architectural elements where they would place a column over them and they would put them sideways so that there was no misunderstanding that they were, they were superseding her, they were dominating her, they were showing her defeat. In spite of all that, the common people continued making little clay figurines, even in Christian graves. And you see that some of the same old iconography that goes back in the case of Egypt goes back 
at least 8,000 years. And the Ankh, the symbol of life, the word that actually means life, is surviving in the Coptic art. Christianized, they add the equal arm cross. You see uh, Orante figures here with the Ankh. And so in Christian Egypt, there was still, it was still drenched in the old culture. It took a long, long time to overthrow all of the cultural associations going on there. But ultimately, what you have is a transformation of the bare-breasted, unveiled Isis with Horus into the veiled and much more severe-looking Madonna. And so this is the, the whole beginning of the Madonna iconography. And what I like to say about the church at this period is that it swallowed the goddess. They couldn't get rid of her. In order to convert all of these pagan nations, they had to incorporate her in another form, and they did narrow her scope. She had to be chaste. She had to be asexual. She had to be things. She didn't have the full sovereignty. Theologically, they would not allow her even to be recognized as a deity. You know, Mary is not God, and you still have Catholic priests going on about that. And the polar opposite of her is the naked and sexualized Eve. And so that's a whole other slideshow that I have called The Goddess Veiled. But that will be for another time. So right. that's it. Well, thank you very much. We'll be back in 15 minutes, streaming again from Magic All 16.